Um, okay, um, so hello everyone. Welcome to the uh, DIMAP seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to, to introduce Pyotr Michek from Jagiellonian University. Uh, Pyotr has a, a very uh, rich track record of fundamental contributions to graph theory. And today he has kindly agreed to tell us about some recent exciting work uh, that appeared at Fox recently on adjacency labeling uh, for planar graphs. Uh, so Piotr, uh, a warm virtual welcome to Warwick and whenever you're ready, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you Torsten for an invitation. Um, I have prepared a, a talk for you uh, about my last research project uh, before the before the lockdown, before the first lockdown. Um, so here you can see all of my collaborators on this work uh, from left to right. You can is is Pat Morin from Ottawa. You can also see him here in a, uh, at the meeting. Gwen Jore uh, from Brussels. Um, Cyril Cavoy from Bordeaux. Louis Espere from Grenoble and Vida Dojmovic from Ottawa. Um, this, this is all about adjacency labeling schemes. A labeling scheme is um, roughly a way to label vertices uh, in a meaningful way, vertices of a graph. So uh, take your favorite class of graphs, uh, and then you, you want to uh, have a way to label the vertices each of each graph in your class, so that there, there is, so that you have still a universal algorithm that given two labels uh, of vertices of some graph, uh, just on the, on the basis of these labels, the algorithm can tell something meaningful about the relation between the vertices. Uh, Piotr? Yes? I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, are you already switching slides because- No, no, I'm not, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, Yes, uh, so the, the the relation you can ask the, the, the is, and what, the relation we'll be studying here is the adjacency relation. But uh, there are various uh, other uh, schemes studied. So the, there is distance labeling scheme and reachability labeling schemes for directed graph. There are various kinds of routing schemes as well. Uh, I think adjacency is presumably the, uh, the most intuitive thing you, you might ask to encode in the labeling. So let's let's indeed move on with the slides and let's uh, let's put some definition. Uh, so a labeling is just a function that sends vertices of a graph to uh, binary strings, and then um, adjacency te tester is this uh, this universal function that we are we are aiming for. So it it gets two labels, so two binary strings at the input, and it produces a single bit with yes or no answer, and then we say that this this tester. This function A works with a graph, with a graph G and its labeling L. If it, indeed given two labels, uh, it, it gives an answer if the vertices behind the label are adjacent or not, yes? And here you have a little example. So you have a cube and the standard uh, labeling of the vertices in the cube. And now you can, you can easily devise uh, adjacency tester, yeah? which basically tests if the two uh, binary strings at the input have, uh, are at distance exactly one, humming distance one, yes? So these two labels, uh, the, the, the function should produce yes answer, and for these two, the answer shall be no. Okay, so that's, uh, that's an example. And now, given the family of graphs, uh, G, we say that this family has a, fn bit adjacency labeling scheme if there is a universal function a such that uh, for every graph in the class and vertex graph in the class there is a way to label the vertices of the graph so that the labels are short here comes the f function yes we we require that the the labels are uh, of length at most fn and uh, the universal function works with our graph and this labeling. So, um, and uh, the result for today's talk 
is that the family of planar graphs has a one plus little o of one log n bit adjacency labeling scheme. So let's uh, build some context around this result. Um, we start with examples. So what happens if, uh, if our class of graphs is just a single graph? Yeah, then the, the whole business gets trivial because um, what, what we can do is we can put unique labels on each vertices, on each vertex. Yeah, so we are using log n, uh, labels of length log n to get unique identifiers. And then our function a is just, uh, is, is just outputs the, the adjacency matrix. Yeah, so this is, this is indeed nothing. And, um, but from this, we can learn that actually log n is the best we can hope for, yeah? As long as, um, as we have a graph such that uh, no two vertices have the same neighborhood, we must use different labels on, each vert uh, on the vertices of our graph. So, uh, log, uh, so labels of length log n is the best we can do. Now, um, now let's, let's, let's get to a class of graphs that actually have some graphs, uh, some more graphs. So let's think about linear forests, so collection of paths, yes? So we are, we are considering here graphs that cons of, on n vertices, say, and, uh, and they, they are just collection of paths. They could be, this could be just an independent set. So how, what is an easy way to label it, an efficient way to label it? Well, again, put some unique identifiers on the vertices, but now respecting somewhat the paths, yeah? So using consecutive labels along each path. And uh, this way, uh, well, our, our uh, tester should, uh, should test if the, uh, if the two labels at the input are consecutive, then there is a chance for an edge. But if there is actually an edge, we should encode putting an extra bit of information. Yeah, so, we are, uh, so this extra bit tells if there is an edge to the vertex left of me in the labeling order. So this is a, this is a, this is, this works for the class of graphs, whatever, whatever is the collection of paths, we'll get the right answers for the adjacency tester. And uh, the scheme is uh, log n plus, plus a constant. Yeah, that's the, that's the sizes of the, of the labels. Now, we are aiming here for planar graphs. So what is the baseline for the planar graphs? Well, we can use that they are five de degenerate. So take the, de uh, the ordering witnessing the degeneracy. So every vertex sees at most five vertices left of it. And now, again, put, uh, put unique identifiers uh, on your vertices. The, you don't have to uh, respect the ordering here, you can but just unique identifiers. So the length of the unique, uh, unique identifier is again log n, well, seal of log n if you want to be precise. And then just concatenate to the label, the labels of the neighbors left of you. There are at most five of them. So the, the, the total length of the label is six times log n. And now it's easy to see that given two labels like that, we can decode if the two vertices are adjacent or not. Because if the two vertices are adjacent, then one of them is right and one of them is left. And on the, on the list of the right vertex, we shall see the identifier of the left vertex. So this is an easy uh, tester to actually check given the two labels, if the vertices behind them are adjacent or not. Okay, so we have an adjacency labeling scheme uh, with label uh, lengths six times log n. And now uh, we, we, we go to some history and related work. So uh, uh, what will be related for us are results for bounded triad graphs. So we start with trees and forests. And there is, uh, in 1990, uh, we, we, we have a, a labeling scheme that is using log n times, uh, uh, not times, but plus uh, lower order term number of bits. So uh, for trees, um, uh, well, trees are one degenerate, right? So this, this idea from the previous slide should give you a baseline two log n labeling scheme. 
And this one is more efficient, is, is not entirely trivial, uh, and gives us one times log n plus a lower order term. And uh, already for trees, we have a lower bound. For puffs, actually, we already have a lower bound log n. So, uh, and uh, okay, and that's that's the result. And then the the there were there are results that are beating the first one in the lower order term. So you see that here we have a log star n. And uh, not so long time ago, we have a result that we can. Uh, there is a GCC labeling scheme for forests using log n plus constant number of bits. Yeah, and this this matches the the lower bound up to this additive constant. Okay, so that's for the for the for the forests. And now just from that we can learn that we can do planar graphs better not with six but with three, because planar graphs have arboricity three. And then, so you can, you can cover or partition the edges into, into three forests and just using the, the labeling schemes for, for, for each forest and concatenating the labels, you get uh, three in front of Logan. Okay, but uh, the best we can do using, uh, using, these, uh, using these results, uh, from related work is actually when we plug in bounded tree situation. So uh, Gavoy and Laburel proved uh, asymptotically optimal um, adjacency labeling scheme for bounded tree width graphs. Uh, yes, so we have one in front of log n and here we have lower order terms. Yes, and using that, uh, we can actually do not only for planar graphs, but for with no KT minor result, in order to prove it, I think you need the, the, the structural graph theorem, right? That every such graph can be two edge two colored. Yeah. So you color the edges with red and blue in such a way that each uh, that in each color, the subgraph induced by the edges in each color has bounded to it. The bound is in function of T, yes. So constant for planar, it would be just a constant to it in each color. And then plugging in the result of Gavoy and Laburel, we get two plus lower order, uh, times log n plus lower order term lab adjacency labeling scheme, labeling scheme for planar graphs. And that was actually the state of art for many years uh, until uh, in 2020, we have a result published by Mark Bonami, Cyril Gavoy, and Michal Pilipchuk, where they, they got a breakthrough. They, uh, they lowered this two to four thirds. And their main tool is a recent uh, product structure theorem for planar graphs. So in order to tell you that, I will first tell you what is a, what is a strong product that, I, that will be the product discussed within this talk. So a strong product of two graphs, so here you have a tree and a path, is a graph that the vertices are, is just a Cartesian product of the vertices of the respective two graphs. And the edges are all the, all the kind of edges you could imagine you want to throw in the, in the product. So uh, these are the edges where one of the coordin coordinate is fixed, and on the other coordinate, you have an edge. Yeah, you see that the path coordinate is fixed here on the yellow edges and the tree coordinate has an edge, yeah? Or the other way around, the tree coordinate is fixed, yeah? And the path coordinate, coordinate has an edge. Or these, I, I, I like to call them diagonal edges, yeah? Where on both coordinates, you have an edge in the in respective graphs. So that's a, that's a strong product of two graphs. And the product structure theorems, uh, Proved by uh, Duimovic, Jure, Morin, myself, Uckert, and Wood, is the result that every planar graph is a subgraph of a strong product of two graphs where one has bounded to it at most eight, and the other is a path. Yeah. So think about your planar graph complex, you can find it in the product of two relatively simple graphs bound okay that's the uh, that's the that's the result and that's the tool here 
And now uh, this product structure theorem is, is also recent, but it already, uh, we were happy to find and to see uh, applications of it all around, mainly in graph colorings. So, uh, so here's the statement again, and uh, already in the in this original paper with the with the uh, with the product structure itself, we proved that um, planar graphs have Q number at most forty nine. Uh, I I'm not going to tell you here what's Q Q layout, what are the Q layouts, and what is the Q number. That was uh, that. That was a central problem in the business of, of layouts, uh, Q layouts, stack layouts of graphs uh, since 1990, I would say. And, um, and the, particularly the question if, if you can do it in a constant way for planar graphs. Um, Qs are kind of colorings, but here you have a, a here you have a, a coloring, a, a, a really a coloring. So soon afterwards, uh, we, there, there is a result that um, you can color the vertices of planar graphs in a constant number of colors, 800 colors, in such a way that on each path, there is no path where you see a repetition of colors, yeah? So repetition is, is one, two, three, one, two, three. That would be a path of length six with a, a colored, with two repeated blocks, yeah? This you don't see in the coloring, yeah? So in particular, it's a proper coloring, right? Because, because a single edge is a path of length two uh, and you, you shall not use the same color because it's a repetition. Uh, but you avoid much, uh, way more. And it was actually open if you can do it uh, with a universal constant bound for all planar graphs and you can do it and you can do that uh, these uh, this product structure is particularly useful uh, with uh, the family of graph parameters capturing sparsity uh, so uh, there is this notion of sparse graphs that build build further on on classes of graphs with forbidden uh, fixed graph as a minor uh, in particular, bounded expansion classes of bounded expansion or nowhere this classes of graphs, and there there are, there are these parameters very useful: weak coloring numbers, strong coloring numbers, p-centered chromatic uh, uh, chromatic numbers. And um, using the product structure, we improved significantly the bounds for here for the p-centered chromatic number. It was it was a polynomial before. Uh, it was, I, I believe, p to the 19, and we have a very clean proof uh, giving uh, a cubic bound. Uh, a very a similar uh, a similar family of parameters was studied by Dvořák and Sereny, fractionary three D fragile graphs, it, and the bounds are very, you see, very much the same, and the proof techniques are also very much the same using the product structure theorem. And finally, I am saying all this because uh, the because the result by Bonami, Gavoy, Pilipchuk on adjacency labelings is actually using the product structure. So here I prepared next a slide, uh, giving you a kind of um, overview on what they prove, on what they did. Well, okay, this that will be the next slide. Let's do some again baseline strategy using the product structure. So uh, what are we dealing with here? Um, we, uh, we have a graph G, presumably planar, and vertices, and we can find it as a subgraph in the, in the product of the bounded triwid graph and the path. Yeah, and now uh, uh, the bounded triwid graph has, say, M vertices, the path has, say, H vertices, and then, uh, and now um, you already seen that if you have a bounded triwid, you can have a very efficient adjacency labeling scheme one times log m, where m is the number of vertices, plus a lower, lower order term, and the same for paths. Uh, so just concatenating these two labels from these two schemes, you get actually a legit labeling scheme of the product, yeah? And con concatenating the two labels in length, it would result in this length here, yeah? You, uh, the plus becomes a, a, a product in the, in the, under the logarithm. And this is 
This is all good for G itself, except the fact that we are dealing with a subgraph situation here. So not necessarily all the edges from the uh, product are present in our graph G, but this is relatively easy to fix. Um, this comes from the fact that um, in the bounded tree width situation, uh, you can not only actually detect an edge, but you can orient the edge. There is a, there is a, there is a kind of degeneracy ordering here. Yeah. Uh, so again, vertices see a bounded number, a tree width bound to the left uh, vertices. And then when you get the when you get the labeling scheme, you actually know which vertex is left, which vertex is right. So you can put additional bits on the right vertex to actually encode uh, if the vertex is pr present in the actual graph we discuss or not. And this will be constant number of bits per vertex, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't change the asymptotics of the of this of the length of the labels in the scheme. And this way we get the we get the labeling scheme. And well. All we can say about M and H is that it's bounded in N. There is nothing more clever to do here. So the actual uh, uh, length of the labels is two times log N plus lower order term. And this is our baseline, two times log N. So what, uh, what Bonami and others did is to get these two down to four thirds. And their trick is as follows. So. Uh, here is, a, here is a visualization of the product structure. So we have a path, and for each vertex of a path, we have a copy of the, of the graph H, which has bounded through it. And now our goal is somewhat to cut the path into pieces and to consider the respective part of the product in the, uh, independently. So we want to cut the path, but we want it in a, to do it in a smart way. So smart means that the, when we cut it, we have the boundary. So we will cut an edge. We remove every other end to the one third edge. Yes. And now in, when we do it, we have some boundary copies of H. Yeah, which are, uh, which are related to the vertices that, that where the edge was removed. Yes. And now what I want here is that the sum of the sizes of these boundary copies, layers, I, I put it here in the slides, is uh, is at most n to the two thirds because we have n to the one third options where to put the cut we can find the cut uh, where the boundary is of size n to the two thirds and then it's relatively straightforward what to do next so on each piece we have a we have a situation where where h is crossed with a path but now the path has length n to the one third yeah so uh, so a baseline uh, labeling scheme gives us actually four thirds times log n bit scheme. And but now, um, so this realizes all the edges that are inside a piece, yeah, inside inside a piece like that. We, what we are missing are the edges between the boundary layers. And in, uh, so in order to do that, we we have to use the trick that actually we can enforce in the encoding in this four third bit encoding that the vertices in the boundary layers, they receive shorter labels. We can do that. We can, we can get uh, two thirds here, two thirds log n, which gives us space for uh, on these vertices to put additional label in the additional labeling scheme, which just does the job here, yeah? So as, as because of our choice, the graph here has n to the two thirds vertices, it has bounded tree width because it's the, the edges are between just two copies. Uh, the copies have tree width, bounded tree width. So the two, two ones also have bounded tree width, just twice the tree width. And we have a union of independent stuff, plenty of independent stuff. So the tree width is indeed constant and the size is n to the two thirds. So the label, the optimal labeling scheme in this situation gives us another two third. So in the boundary situation, we have a two third from the from one the labeling and two third log n from the other labeling. In total, it's four third log n, and that was that's the that's the trick they did. So uh, what we are doing is um, we actually go back to this baseline idea, and and that's our starting point. We don't play with the trick of cutting the path. 
And um, so what I do here is what we used to do and what we also did in the paper, I will show you a special case of our strategy of our labeling scheme that doesn't work on H cross P where H has bounded uh, tree word, but works on P cross P. So we are dealing here with subgraphs of a pro strong product of two paths, okay? And uh, it is interesting because actually all the main ideas are here. Yeah, there is, uh, there is some work, uh, it gets technical, but the ideas, uh, at least for us critical, are already present in the P cross P situation. So here we are, we have a subgraph, a G, subgraph of P cross P. G has N vertices. And now, um, what are we going to do? Well, first we, um, we observe some, um, we use some standard tricks from the, from the labeling to, uh, scheme business. So uh, look, each, gr each graph here, each path which, which is in the row uh, has, some, has some size. The sum of the sizes is actually N. Uh, and now the, the idea is that uh, instead of encoding a length of the row, like blindly using log H bits, we, we shall insist, yeah, that's, that's the first idea, easy one. We shall insist that when the row has a, has a large number of vertices, yeah, we should make its label short to make more space to actually encode the, the business within the row. And if the row has small number of vertices, may, perhaps it could have a, a larger label, yeah? So uh, mm, this is what is going to, the labels uh, in this situation are, are usually encoded with the binary search tree. I'm sure that all of us know what is a binary search tree. Uh, the nodes are, are numbers, real numbers, yeah? And then, uh, and then the actual label will be just uh, uh, the signature of, uh, of, uh, of a number. So the label here would be zero, one, zero. That would be, that would be the label. And now, given the labels like that, that correspond to paths in our in some binary search tree, we actually immediately just given the two signatures, that I will call them signatures, the 0, 1, 0 is a signature. Uh, given two signatures, I can already recognize if the value, which value is smaller and which value is larger. That's just a lexicographic ordering, right? And then um, the standard trick uh, is the weighted scheme for paths, which says that, okay, so you, we have our numbers but we put some weights on the numbers and that's the W function, yeah? And then there is a way to produce a binary search tree such that uh, vertices of larger weight are closer to the root. So their signatures, their label, final labels are shorter, exactly what, I, what we wanted, yeah? So W is the sum of, the, of, all, the, of all the weights. yeah? And what we require is that uh, the, the depth of Y, yeah? which corresponds to the length of the signature of Y is actually at most logarithmic in the weight minus logarithm of the, of the weight of, w, of Y itself. So if Y has large weight, we actually insist that the depth is, is small. Yeah, and here is, a, here is a short impression how to prove it. Maybe let's skip it because this is not uh, meaningful for us. Uh, and then, um, and then the other thing to do, which is I think also standard in the binary search tree situation, is that whenever we have a, whenever we have a, a vertex y, and we have its signature, we can easily encode uh, with a little extra information. We can easily encode the signature of the first value value left in the binary search tree of y. Yeah. So what am I saying here is, for example, this is the value y, yeah? So where is the first value that is uh, less of y in the binary search tree? If y doesn't have the left child, then we should look at it above, and this will be the vertex, yeah? So if y has no child, which we can record with one extra bit of information, we should just, uh, we are looking for some ancestor of y. So all we need to do is encode the length of the signature of the ancestor that we are looking at. 
and that will be the first uh, value less of y. And in the case when y has a child, yeah, so let's draw it here. So y has a left child, yeah. So where is the where is the where is the first value less of less of y? This is we go to the left subtree and then we go maximally to the right, yeah. And that's the vertex, which has smaller value than y and it's next to y. Yeah, and this indeed we can also encode easily. We just have to re re remember how far we should go down. And this is this is uh, this is this distance is log the number of bits is logarithmic in the height of the tree, and that's that's what I wanted to sell here in this picture. And and uh, the conclusion is this weighted scheme for paths. So there is a universal function that will output uh, not only adjacent, not adjacent, but it will output. If, uh, if, the, if there is an edge to the left, edge to the right, if the vertices are the same, or if there is no edge, yeah? And then uh, our path will be on H vertices, like in our, uh, finally in our product, and we have a weight function. And then the actual labels are here, yes? And they will be, uh, their size will be the logarithm of the total sum minus logarithm of the weight. Of the of the vertex itself plus some lower order term business, yeah. Okay, so that's that's the weighted scheme for paths. And now we're back uh, to the uh, to the general concept. Excuse me. So uh, so what is our strategy here? Uh, a vertex in the product looks like this. And now, oh, are you hearing me well? I see some internet connection problem. Are you with me? We can hear you now, Peter, but on the last slide, you dropped out for a few seconds. Okay, okay, apologies. Um, so um, what is the situation? We have a vertex in the product. We're going to define a row label and a column label. So uh, a row label, will come from the weighted scheme, yeah? So the weights will be just the sizes of the corresponding rows. And then the row label, the length of the row label will be log n because n is the sum of our weights, yeah? Minus log of the size of the row itself, yeah? Plus a, a smaller, a lower order term. And now the column label, uh, a co uh, well, Actually, this is misleading here, yeah, that to say a column label, yeah, because there is in our business, there will be no general meaning of a column. But uh, when I look at the, at the graph like this, yeah, this is a collection of paths inside one row. And I can put uh, on the vertices here, uh, extra label that I call a column label. And based on that, I will recognize if the two vertices are adjacent within this graph induced by a row or not. And now, um, what is the situation? Given two labels like that, can we, can we fix it? Because this is very tempting, you see, the actual size of the concatenation is exactly log n plus lower order term. So this looks like a really good idea. Uh, so let's take two labels. Based on the row labels, yeah, we can say, if the two rows are the same or not. If the two rows are the same, then just based on the column label, we'll judge, we'll verify if the two vertices are adjacent or not. Here they are not adjacent, here they are adjacent. This is, this is okay. If the two rows are far away from each other, we'll just output no. That's easy, yeah? And finally, we will be able to recognize if the two rows are adjacent to each other, like this. And now we should rely, hopefully, on the column labels, yes? But here comes the problem, that actually a column label of one vertex comes from the different scheme and of the other vertex comes from the different scheme. They are not compatible. We, we, cannot, we cannot work on them together, yeah? And that's our problem, and that's a, that's a major problem of this strategy. So to overcome it, we, we have to come up with a transition label. 
this is the amount of space we have. Yeah, we already use log n. So we need to fit in in the lower order term. And the strategy is that given a label in the scheme for the row here above, we will, we, and based on the transition label, we can get the label of the vertex in the scheme below in the next row. If we succeed, then we can finish the algorithm of the tester and we are done. So that's, that's all we do. Yeah. And in order to do that, well, we have to forget about preparing column labels independently. Yeah. Because they, one must be close to the other. So the, so the lower order term transition label is enough. So the way we see it is that uh, these labeling schemes, which are based again on binary search trees, so we have binary search trees here, T1 to TH, is actually a trace of a single dynamic binary search tree, yeah, which uh, undergoes in, uh, insertions, deletions. We also, as you will see, have to do rebalancing. And now, um, so how do we approach it? Well. First of all, you see uh, one row to the next row, the whole graph can change. All the, we can have disjoint, uh, disjoint set of vertices and this will be very difficult to, to actually have one tree being close to the other. So we do what, they, what people say is a standard trick here, a fractional cascading. So we throw in vertices so that the total number of vertices in our graph is, is at most twice or four times the, the, the previous one. But now the two, uh, the two, uh, two consecutive sets are not so far from uh, each other in a sense that there is no long sequence in one set that is not split by a vertex from the other. And this is what we do, what we do with a chunking set. So uh, maybe, maybe let's, let's put it for A equals one immediately. So, uh, so we start with, uh, with the rows, yeah? That's our sets. Uh, S, S1 to SH is the vertex, vertex sets of, of the rows, yeah? And we can find supersets of those, yeah? Dy, such that they are chunking. What does it mean that, it's, uh, that, the, that the, the sequence is one chunking? So the two consecutive sets, Vy and Vy plus one, are close to each other. So whenever you have a sequence of A plus one elements in one, there is an element uh, between them of the other. Yeah, and that's exactly the property I was trying to envision you here. Yeah, and we can do this. We can go to the superset, the supersets, and the total sum of the sizes is at most four times the times the total sum of the original row. So at most four times n in our situation. So this is okay. And now, um, now the when we move from one row to the other, we have insertions. We have deletions, and uh, and yes, we will have to rebalance. So uh, how does it look like quickly? Um, when we do insertions, yeah. So uh, we have a binary search tree like this, and then uh, this is ti, and then some vertices we want to we want to introduce some vertices, but but because of the chunking function uh, chunking property we actually know that at most one vertex will be attached to each leaf, yeah? So, so it, it, it might look like this. So the height of the new tree is at most uh, the height of the old tree plus one. And it has no impact on the signatures of the, of the vertices that were already there, which is important because for the transition label. Here, the signature didn't change, so transition will be easy. And then the deletions. So the, the, uh, we do the deletion with the standard binary search tree algorithm for deletions, which means that uh, when you have uh, when you want to remove a vertex here, uh, what you do is you are actually uh, replacing it with the with the with the value next to it, say larger than it. Yeah. So if a vertex is a leaf, you just remove it, and if it's not a leaf, you you replace, you find the, the value which is next to it, say larger, put it here, yeah, and iterate down up, 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 to, the, up, up to the leaf. So here the, the signature of this vertex could change, but what is important 
is that um, that if it changes, it gets it only gets to this prefix. And getting to the prefix is easy for the transition uh, label because you just put uh, the the size of the prefix, uh, and that's it. And then there must be a rebalancing because um, you know if we let it go like that, uh, the heights don't change much, the sizes from the chunking property don't uh, don't change much, but over the course of many many rows, uh, these constants can add up. So we have a we have an uh, we have a concept. How to balance out things? Maybe, maybe I briefly tell you that and save you the analysis. So, uh, a ba balance of x and k. X is a node in a tree. K is a parameter of how, say, deep we want to do the balancing. And then we we find the vertices that are uh, that should be placed. Yeah, we find the values that should be placed in the perfect binary search tree like this. Put them in the right places so that the subtrees here are, are, are of the sizes that you expect, yeah? One over two to the K of the, of, the whole, of the whole thing. And that's the single step that we are going to do. And, and now obviously the la a label of a vertex yeah, can change, but you can, you, can, you can find that the, you can encode the transition using this number of bits, K, where K is this parameter, how deep we go, times log log N. And then the, 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 balance, the balancing procedure uh, starts with the, excuse me, with the first row. Yeah, we have the binary search tree with no assumptions. We insert stuff, we delete stuff, and we balance. We balance it with, uh, with the root, yeah? And then goes, uh, this is tree two, yeah? We insert, we delete, and we balance. But now we balance, in each subtree independently here, going another k steps down. And this is what we do step by step, row by row. And now if we, if we, if we take k, which is larger than a constant, well, we can actually prove that the height of the tree is always bounded by the perfect height, which is log of the size of the tree. And here is what we lose, one over k times uh, times log of the size. So uh, here, the better k, the, the larger k we could take, we could take k to be the whole height, and then that would be simply a whole rebalancing. The larger k we take, the better is the, is the, is the, is the balance. But you have to remember that we have a trade-off here. Well, on one hand, we, uh, we have transition codes that takes k times log log n bits. On the other hand, when we do do the balancing, the height, which will be the length of the signature, so the length of the labels, gets this factor. So when we optimize the choice of k, so uh, we pick this, this function of n here, we get, we get our uh, resulting labels. So our, this will be our column labels, yeah, which will be log of the size of the row plus this error term, roughly square root of log n. Okay, so um, yeah, what is missing here in this presentation? Well, I did talk about the product P cross P, but the result is about the product of H cross P. Yeah, so now instead of, so the row labels are the same, but within each row, we have actually a bounded tree width situation, which requires additional care. Another piece that is missing is that uh, I, I didn't uh, comment here again on the fact that we are in the in the subgraph of a strong probe. Yeah, but this this is again done with the oh actually in the p cross p situation this is easy because let me get back to because every vertex has bounded degree. Yeah, so here it would be very easy because you just put at the end of the label. How many edges do we have here? Four, eight, yeah? So it must, so we put a vector of length eight encoding if actually each of the eight edges is present around the vertex or not. And in the H cross P situation, this requires additional care, but it's not difficult. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to conclude a bit here. So let me just mention you that there is a connection easy connection 
between uh, adjacency labeling schemes and universal graphs. So for a class of graph C, we have a universal graph U if, um, uh, if what? If every graph or every n vertex gra uh, uh, graph from the class can be found as an induced subgraph of our universal graph. And now there is there is a if and only if relation. If you have f n bit adjacency labeling scheme, you get universal graphs of size two to the f of n, which immediately uh, here is a quick proof. Let me skip it, uh, which immediately says that planar graphs have universal graphs on this number of edges. Which uh, so the one comes from the one in front of the logarithm. Yeah, so before the four third was in front of the logarithm, so you had n to the four third at vertices. Now we have close to linear number of vertices, which is, which is a bit weird actually, right? Uh, there is a there is a follow up work that builds on it. Uh, so Louis, Gwen, and Pat prove that actually you can get down also the number of edges in the graph. Yeah, we don't discuss the the edges of the universal graph here. In our labeling scheme business, but you can do it, and it, it is also almost linear. Okay, so there are two obvious open problems here left. Uh, let me show the both of them you immediately. So one is the is the lower order term. Yeah. Uh, well, this is what we get from our scheme, and the only lower bound is constant. Yeah, so for forests, there was some work which additionally was was closed with a with a with an adjacency scheme that that uses indeed extra only constant number of bits. Here in this in this trade of business, we are losing something. But but most of the labeling schemes from the past had the lower order term. Maybe maybe you can reduce it. This is this is one open problem. The other open that I actually like more because I'm I'm more computational in nature is to actually ask what happens for the for the KT minor free graphs. Yeah, the our adjacency labeling scheme doesn't work because the products there is no product structure theorem for the KT minor, and the four third also doesn't work. The one that works is is the two coloring of the edges. So we have two log n. Uh, and it would be really, uh, who knows? Maybe we will see some in the near future. But for now, uh, although I'm alone in my room, but I hope that you were with me. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Peter, for the very nice talk. Um, so if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can also just type it into the chat. Yes, I would be happy to ask something. So thanks, Plotter, for the very nice talk. Um, you mentioned um, you mentioned this related result or building on, 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 on one of your papers about these non-repetitive colorings with the 768 um, as, as, as a bound on the chromatic number. Are there like, are there any lower bounds or are there any other interesting notions of coloring where this is still open for planar graphs? Like even more general than non-repetitive or this is like the most general one? Yeah, thanks, Thorsten. Um, so for one, it's uh, it seems like it's almost half of the research project to find the right problem. If you have the right problem, if I would have the right problem, I wouldn't share it with you here. I would just, uh, you know, so this is really, uh, indeed, it's, um, we kept saying at the beginning, uh, one year ago or so that, okay, tell us your problems, we will, we will, we'll do something about them. But, um, and this adjacency labeling scheme was the, for me, at, at start was the most uh, uh, surprising one. Yeah, I didn't see the connection at the beginning, I had to, it had to grow on me. Uh, for the, the connection to the colorings, I mean, to the vertex colorings. Yes, the vertex coloring somewhat were uh, more natural uh, because we started from cues, which are a bit like colorings. 
-hmm. And for the non-repetitive colorings, um, I, I, I don't know a, a particular open one. I know there was a palindrome free mm -hmm, mm -hmm. coloring. Is it, it was open even for paths. That was the one of the problems I really liked, but I, mm -hmm. I didn't look at it for for years now. Uh, for, you know, for planograms themselves, I don't really know. I, I don't know. And really the 768? Like, oh, it's not tight. It, it's not tight. It's, um, Pat, do you know the number? I think the last time I looked, the lower bound was eight or something. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. but the yeah. 700 is not tight. Uh, if you use the 303 uh, version of the product structure, you get down to something. But is it yeah. two digits or three or still three digits? I don't remember. Yeah, that I don't remember either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? While we wait, uh, if I could ask one, Piotr. So, uh, how far have you been able to generalize this result to superclasses of planar graphs? Oh, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> so. Uh, so the product structure itself is, is pretty robust. Uh, so as I mentioned, we don't have it for the KT minor free graphs. That would somehow would somehow replace a bit the product structure, the, the, the graph minor structure theorem. But we have it for the uh, for the bounded genus situation. We have it for the for other sparse classes of graphs like K planar graphs. So you can think of one planar graph, which is uh, you can draw it in the plane, but you allow each edge to cross uh, at most one other edge. So you can think of a of a grid with the with uh, crossed boxes, yeah, with diagonals in each cells. And actually, this graph contains every the family of graphs like that contains every graph as a minor. But it's still sparse in some sense, and it, it is it is a subject of the product structure. Um, so you think that the product structure holds also, but you can't prove it for these more general ones? Oh, that's a tough question. Uh, wait, um, we did have some characterization of the very of the very specific statement of the product structure that we cannot go above. What was it? Pat, do you remember this bit? Apex minor free. Apex minor free. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but there is a speculation if uh, if something like that or or using our well not, well using this these um, ideas you could actually get closer to the KT minor free situation. We wish so, but uh, this looks difficult actually. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Jim. Um, we have time for maybe one more question. I don't see any forth coming. Uh, so is there, oh, okay, so there's a comment from Yarek in the chat that the current lower bound for non-repetitive coloring of planar graphs uh -huh, is uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, Very good, very good. Thanks. Yarek, if you would answer that question. Hmm. Uh, the lower bound is 11, OK. okay. Nice to see Thanks you. Nice, nice talk. OK, so if there are no more questions. So let's thank Piotr again for the very nice talk. Thank you all for joining. And see you at the uh, next DevOps seminar. Thanks. Thanks, Piotr. I have to rush also.